Hi everybody, welcome to a brand new lecture of the Ankit Faria Certified Ethical Hacker course. We will continue where we ended the previous lecture, which was uh, on Trojans, uh, keyloggers, spyware, and all sorts of fun things that allow a criminal remote control and remote access to the victim's computer. So in the previous lecture, we have seen everything from the attacker's perspective, how you can actually infect the victim's computer, how you can avoid detection in terms of antiviruses, and how you can actually start controlling the victim's computer. Unfortunately, we did not get the time in the previous lecture to switch roles and talk about things from a victim's perspective. What can a victim do to protect themselves against Trojan attacks? So I'd like to start today's lecture by talking about the solutions and the countermeasures that you can implement to ensure that your computer does not get attacked uh, using a Trojan. And then I'd like to start a brand new type of attack, which is how to crack all kinds of passwords. So one by one we'll be discussing how to crack a variety of different types of passwords that are commonly used on the internet, be it your Windows login password, a file or document password, an online account password, or just about any other password on the internet. So that's going to be the agenda for today's uh, lecture. Uh, password cracking is a pretty long topic. So I may not be able to cover the entire password cracking topic or all the different types of password cracking techniques in uh, just today's lecture. So it will probably continue that uh, uh, into the next uh, lecture as well. Because password cracking, as you can understand, can be a very interesting topic. At the same time, it's very comprehensive and very, uh, you know, very long because there's just so many different types of passwords that exist on the internet that uh, a criminal can try to crack. But before we actually discuss that, I'm, I would like to cover the uh, solutions part of Trojans, how you can ensure that somebody else does not hack into your computer using a Trojan. Or, in other words, if you think somebody has hacked into your computer using a Trojan, what can you do to protect yourself? So typically, whenever you feel that somebody is hacked into your computer using a Trojan or is trying to hack into your computer using a Trojan, it's time to call the protection or call the police. Essentially, you obviously don't call the police, but then there are simple things that you can do on your computer to remove a Trojan. See, if the criminal is using a regular traditional Trojan, like NetBuzz, Back Orifice, Sub7, and so on, then the solution is very simple. The solution for you is to just use an antivirus software on your computer. But let's assume that the criminal is not using a traditional Trojan. What if the criminal is using a fully undetectable Trojan? Then what is the solution that you can implement to protect yourself, to detect the Trojan and to remove the Trojan? Now, in such a scenario, if the criminal is using a fully undetectable Trojan, then using an antivirus software is not going to help you. Because by definition, a fully undetectable Trojan will not get detected by an antivirus. So in such a scenario, you need to use simple manual techniques to detect Trojans and then to remove Trojans from your computer. Now first of all, talking about the automatic solutions, there is a software called Zamana Anti-Spyware that kind of specializes in detecting and removing spyware, Trojans, keyloggers and so on. So I would recommend that if you feel that there is a problem on your system, you should look into using Zamana Anti-Spyware. But let's assume that does not help you. Then you need to start relying on manual techniques of detecting and removing Trojans. So to, to be able to manually detect and remove a Trojan from your computer, first of all you need to understand the important conditions that are required for a Trojan to work successfully and on any computer. Be it a regular Trojan, that is a traditional Trojan, or whether it's a fully undetectable Trojan. The conditions that must be fulfilled are the following. Condition one is that the Trojan must open a port on the victim's computer. Be it a traditional Trojan or a FUD Trojan, fully undetectable Trojan, each of them have to open a port on your machine, only then they can communicate with the criminal. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that the Trojan must be running in the memory of the victim's computer. 
If the Trojan is not running in the memory, if the Trojan is not loaded into the memory, then it's not going to be able to do anything. Condition 3 is that the Trojan must automatically start whenever Windows boots. Because otherwise what will happen is, if the Trojan does not automatically start whenever Windows boots, you could restart the computer and the Trojan will not start and then you are, you are protected or you are safe again. So these three conditions must always be fulfilled for a Trojan to successfully work, for a criminal to be able to successfully use a Trojan to control the victim's computer. So when you want to manually remove a Trojan, you need to check for these three conditions. If you want to manually detect that there is a Trojan on your computer, you need to manually check for these three conditions. So let us see one by one how you can check for each of these conditions. So the condition one was Trojan must open a port on your computer, that is on the victim's computer. So there is a software called Cur Ports or Current Ports. There is another software called TCP View which we have seen earlier in this course that will scan your computer tell you all the list of applications running on your computer that have opened a particular port on your computer. So let us test this out. If you remember in the previous lecture, I had actually infected my own computer with a Trojan. So I have still enabled that Trojan, that Trojan is still running on my computer. So let us see whether we can detect that Trojan using the TCP view software. So I am going to open the TCP view software on my computer and within a few seconds TCP view does a quick scan of my computer and figures out a list of applications that are running on my computer uh, that have opened some ports on my computer. So if you look at the screen, these are all the applications that um, have opened ports on my computer. So I am going to one by one uh, look at these apps. right? So, first of all, you have some system process, so that's probably not a Trojan. Then you have some Apple ID uh, apps, which means that it's iTunes or some Apple uh, software that I'm running. Then you have Google Chrome, so these are all, you know, Google Chrome uh, uh, connections that have been opened. And if I keep scrolling down, suddenly I come across something called patch.exe. Patch.exe, I don't remember installing a software called Patch.exe on my computer. So that could be a Trojan. So let me do a quick Google search of Patch.exe. to find. I, I'm trying to find out what is Patch.exe. So I'm googling Patch.exe, what is it? So I open up that file, I'll open up the results. And it kind of gives me some kind of analysis on what is patch.exe. I can look at a couple of other um, websites. It says, is patch.exe harmful and so on. So typically patch.exe is used by Netbus. So I know that okay, patch.exe is Netbus so or it's a Trojan. So now I go back to TCP view and I right click on patch.exe and I can click on process properties. Process properties will actually give me some information about where is this app installed. So in this case if you notice, it tells me that okay, it is running from some particular folder. So I can actually go to that folder and further investigate whether it is a good app or whether it is a bad app. And once I am convinced that it is a bad app, once I know that this is not an app that I had installed, I just click on the end process button and as soon as I press end process, it will actually automatically delete that app uh, from the memory and it will close the port that that app had opened on my computer, as simple as that. So if you notice patch.exe is no longer getting displayed in TCP view. So the condition one for a Trojan to work successfully is that it must open a port on your computer. So if you suspect that there is a FUD Trojan on your computer and since an antivirus is not able to detect it, you can manually check which ports are open on your computer using TCP view software 
and then if you find a suspicious port or a suspicious application on your uh, in the output of TCP view, then you know that okay, it's something that uh, could be you know harming your machine. So you go ahead and try to remove it from the memory. So that's the first step or the first way of manually checking for FUD trojans on your computer. The second condition for a trojan to work successfully on your machine, be it a regular trojan or a FUD trojan, is that the trojan must be running in the memory of your computer. So let us now see how you can find out what are the apps running in the memory of your computer and how to get rid of those apps. So there's a software called System Internals Process Explorer. System Internals Process Explorer. So I'm going to try and open up this software on my computer. Process Explorer. I hope I have it on my computer. All right, so I think I found Process Explorer. And when I run that file, Let's wait for it to open up. So follow if you look at this screen, the Process Explorer app has finally opened on my computer. And what it does is that it basically shows me an entire list of different um, apps or tools that are currently loaded in the memory and that are running in the memory. So once again, I can manually go through this list. And whenever I find that there is an app that I don't know about, I can right click on it and I can click on search online. And it will then do a Google search and tell me whether it is a safe software or whether it is a uh, you know malicious software so conhost.com or conhost.exe whether it is real or whether it is malicious uh, is something that you can find out from google.com so there are um, complete blogs that are dedicated to figuring out which apps are safe, which apps are not safe. So that's how you can basically detect uh, some malicious apps running on your computer. If you want to get rid of that app, you can right click on it and click on suspend. Or you can permanently delete it as well. Kill, or you can kill the process as well. So all sorts of options are available with the System Internals Process Explorer app. The third condition that you need to check for is whether the Trojan is automatically starting whenever Windows boots or not. See, for any successful Trojan to run properly, it must add like an automatic start entry to the Windows registry or to the startup files on your computer. Because without that, if you just shut down your machine and restart it, the Trojan will no longer uh, get loaded in the memory. So Trojans automatically add this entry so that they are always running in the memory. So let us now see how you can detect that. The name of the software is System Internals Auto Runs. System internals auto runs. So I'm going to try to open that on my computer. System internals auto runs.
and if all of you look at the screen this is what the app looks like it has loaded an entire list of different apps that are automatically starting on my machine as soon as I boot windows some of these are system apps some of these are apps that I've installed while others are trojans as well or could be trojans as well so it's important for me to then one by one look at each one of these entries and make sure that it's only apps that are safe that are starting whenever I start windows so say for example if I look carefully, there's an app called patch.exe, which is basically Netbus. So if I don't want it to start automatically, I just need to deselect it. So now, next time I restart my computer, patch.exe will not uh, start automatically. So if I do these simple things on my computer, I can actually easily detect whether there is a Trojan running on my computer or not. As simple as that. Just the way we had system internals auto runs, we also have MS config. MS config pretty much does the same thing. It displays a list of uh, apps that uh, run on my computer automatically whenever Windows boots. So I open up MS config on my computer. And if you look at the screen, it's basically showing me a list of services that start automatically and a list of apps that start automatically whenever Windows boots on my computer. And I could, I could deselect some apps that I don't want to start automatically. I can, uh, you know, remove any malicious looking apps that I don't trust so that they don't actually start automatically whenever I, I start my computer. So that's how you can actually easily detect the presence of a fully undetectable Trojan on your computer. You don't really need an antivirus software. If you do these three simple tests or three simple checks, you can pretty much detect and remove all kinds of Trojans from your computer. Another very simple software that I like to kind of recommend to all of you is a software called Driver View. It shows all the device drivers that get loaded on your system. Similarly, you have another software called Service Manager. It shows you all the services that are running on your uh, computer at any given point of time. And finally, there is a very, very interesting website which I like to share with all of you called VirusTotal.com. VirusTotal.com is a website where you can actually upload any file of your choice and it will scan that file and tell you whether the signature of that file resembles the signature of a Trojan or a virus or not. Or it will tell you basically whether a file has some virus or Trojan hidden inside it or not. So that's what VirusTotal.com does. So with that we conclude the uh, topic of Trojans, spyware, keyloggers and so on. So we discuss a wide variety of different ways in which you can uh, infect somebody else's computer, monitor their computer, control their computer and then we also discuss the countermeasures or solutions that you can implement to be ready to detect fully undetectable Trojans and to remove them from your computer so that you are no longer vulnerable uh, to such kind of attacks. At this point of time, I like to quickly move on to another very commonly found attack known as password cracking or how to crack different types of passwords. Now, I think all of us at some point of time in our lives or the other have wanted to be able to crack somebody else's password. So be it your best friend's Facebook account password or be it you know, maybe your neighbor's Wi-Fi password or be it your colleague's Windows login password. You've always wanted to crack some kind of password or the other. So in this particular topic of the AFC course, we will one by one discuss all the different ways of cracking passwords and then we'll, we'll discuss specific 
types of passwords and then see how we can crack uh, those kinds of passwords. So it's a very long, very comprehensive uh, topic. It will probably, uh, you know, take up all of the lecture today till the very end. And even the next lecture will be focused purely on cracking passwords. So what are the different ways of cracking passwords? Uh, typically, if you are a criminal and if you want to actually get into somebody else's account or whatever, the first thing that you will do is actually password guessing. It's not really a cracking technique. It's not a password cracking technique. But having said that, everybody guesses passwords. That's the first thing that you'll try to do. And even guessing of passwords, there can it can be an art. So typically, one of the most commonly used passwords in India is to use your name followed by a birth date. So I, I can use a password like Ankit2405 or Ankit2405885. Or another very common password is to use your mobile phone number as your password. I won't be surprised if many of you are doing that. Another very commonly used password is to use your girlfriend or boyfriend's name followed by his or her birth date. I would say never ever use such passwords because such passwords can easily be guessed. They are all examples of weak passwords that anybody can guess. Especially your friends can easily guess because they already have all that information about you. You could also use the license plate registration number of your bike or car. That also is a bad uh, password. So do not ever use such passwords. The second technique of cracking password, actually the first technique, because password guessing is not really a technique. So the first technique of guessing passwords or cracking passwords rather is dictionary-based attacks. In a dictionary-based attack, what happens is the criminal will use an automatic software which will one by one try out each and every word that appears in the dictionary as your password. So if your password is actually a word that appears in the dictionary, it will take maybe one or two hours for a criminal to use a dictionary based attack to one by one automatically try out all the dictionary words as your password and crack your password. So the moral of the story here is do not ever use a word that appears in the dictionary as your password. The, sec the second type of password cracking technique that is commonly used by criminals is brute force attacks. So what exactly are brute force, uh, brute force attacks? So in brute force attacks what happens is the criminal will once again use an automatic software which will one by one try out every single permutation and combination of the keyboard as the victim's password. So. In brute force attacks, no matter what kind of password you are using, sooner or later, the correct password will be cracked. Or the correct password will, will be reached and your password gets cracked. So brute force attacks, there is no, no real solution to it. I mean, there is a solution, but we will get to that later on. But right now, just understand that dictionary-based attacks can crack a password if the password is a word that appears in the dictionary. In brute force attacks, no matter what kind of password you're using, it has to be some permutation combination of the keyboard. So sooner or later, your password will get cracked. So that is what brute force attacks are all about. Another very common strategy to find out somebody else's password, which is becoming very popular in India, is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is a technique where the criminal will stand just behind you and he'll wait for you to uh, log into your account. And while you're typing the password, since he's standing behind you, he will be keeping a track of all the keys that you're pressing on your keyboard. And that's how he'll actually try to find out what your password is. So that technique is called shoulder surfing. When somebody is standing just behind you to kind of find out what